All right, good evening, everyone. Welcome to our Thursday night class. Glad you're here and those online as well. A um, couple of uh, announcements to make. Uh, uh, Tuesday night's uh, lesson uh, was on YouTube, on Facebook. Uh, probably came out okay, but on Facebook, uh, terrible recording, and it actually cut out with about uh, 10 minutes left um, and didn't record the end of it. Uh, again, it's uh, uh, updates in YouTube and uh, our software. Um, and uh, configurations have changed, and we can't figure out how to do it and how to get it right. Uh, you know, I'm not an expert at this. My wife is not an expert at this, and uh, I don't think anybody else in the church is an expert at this. So um, I'm getting a little frustrated. And uh, if we could have help from people, uh, again, uh, either hired help or somebody... Uh, come and uh, help us online that uh, may know how to do these things. That would be greatly appreciated. Uh, and if not, I'm ready to just can the whole thing. So um, so we put that request out there, and um, if we can get some help in the near future, that would be greatly appreciated. Otherwise, we'll just have to stop streaming altogether because it's just getting too much of a distraction for me and uh, too much of a headache uh, in general. So uh, hopefully we can uh, get some help soon. All right, so uh, with that said, um, uh, any prayer requests other than our, assist, our computer stuff? Any uh, prayer requests that we might have tonight? Anything to add? Anything to add? All right, nothing at all. All right, so let's begin as we normally do with a moment of silent prayer to give ourselves an opportunity, if necessary, to apply 1 John 1 9, the rebound technique, again, to ensure the filling of God the Holy Spirit. And as we adjust to the justice of God, we will be prepared for the intake of the Word of God. So if necessary, let us pray. And Heavenly Father, we humbly come before you this day to praise you, to worship you, and to glorify you through the study of your word. And Father, we thank you for all the blessings that you have provided for us and our families and for our church. We thank you for uh, all the uh, logistical grace blessings, uh, our physical needs, and also our spiritual needs. And we thank you now for the spiritual food that you're about to provide for us so that we go forward in your will and in your plan. And Father, we pray for our nation this evening that you have your hand upon on it, watch over it, protect and guide it, leading our president to make good, wise decisions that honor our Constitution and your word, and read out the, any evil that may be within our government, and uh, bring in righteousness and justice, and uh, also your word and your divine establishment principles once again. And Father, we pray for our church that you have your hand upon it, that you watch over it, protect and guide it, leading us in all our endeavors according to your will. We especially pray for our uh, video and online access, and Father, for help uh, there. We ask that you raise somebody up to uh, come forward that can help us there and uh, solve the problem so that we can continue to reach out to those around the world and continue to support our local assembly also with the appropriate uh, 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 needs and lessons according to your will. So, Father, we also pray for all of those on our prayer list that have various health needs and issues, especially for all of those uh, struggling with uh, uh, cancer and battling that. We pray for each and every one of them. Continue to pray for George and his healing and recovery. We thank you for him being here tonight, Father, and for bringing healing into his life. We ask that you continue to bring healing. Also praying for my mother's health issues and needs, and we uh, pray for continued help there. Also praying continue for the Costa family and Schmidt family for the loss of their father this uh, past week, and uh, ask that you continue to help them and uh, uh, overcome uh, that great loss and help them through this time of mourning. And also... Uh, uh, help them to come to know your son, Jesus Christ, uh, throughout this process as well. And Father, we pray for all of those who are also on our prayer list and all the missionaries, evangelists, and pastors that we're aware of. We pray for each and every one of them, that you protect and guide them, keep them safe, and lead them in the truth of your word so that we continue to go forward as a client nation unto you. So, Father, we thank you for this time of gathering together. We ask that you lead us now to lift up our hearts in song and in praise. In Christ's precious name, amen. We all rise for our doxology. Great God, from whom all blessings. 
blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above you, heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Thank you very much, and please be seated. All right, thank you for the doxology and the opening prayer. Let's turn our Bibles to uh, Luke chapter 24, Luke chapter 24. And uh, as we uh, noted on uh, Tuesday evening, we are uh, noting in verses 4 and 8, where the women now are presented at the tomb of our Lord, by, uh, or addressed at the tomb of our Lord by two angels as they come, find the stone rolled away, uh, some Gospel accounts just say they looked in and saw the empty tomb, and then others have them interacting with the uh, angels, and uh, so that's what we're noting now, their interaction with these angels as we see it in all of the gospel accounts. And in Luke chapter four, uh, 24, verses 4 through 8, it reads, And it happened that while they were perplexed about this, again, the stone being rolled away, behold, two men suddenly stood near uh, them in dazzling apparel. And as the women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but he is risen. Remember how he spoke to you while he was still in Galilee, saying that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words. And so... We went through the exegesis of those various passages, noted all the uh, details and nuances of uh, what was happening and in the interaction of these uh, angelic creatures that came down and became great messengers of the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And as we uh, see in the very last verse, it says, And they remembered his words. And because, again, our video cut out on uh, Tuesday night, uh, there were three important points that I wanted to uh, uh, bring and uh, uh, very excited about teaching. But again, unfortunately, we taught it to those who are face to face. Uh, and those on Facebook uh, probably saw it as well. But again, on YouTube, it did get cut out. So I did want to start with that and remind you of uh, these passages. As we've been noting, again, this is paralleled in Matthew, Mark, and John. We're going to go into Matthew and Mark again this evening. But the principles that we left off with is the emphasis of the importance of the retention and recall of the Word of God that we also call Bible doctrine. And again, if we don't retain and recall the Word of God and then apply it within our lives, we're going to be making all kinds of uh, bad decisions. We're going to be living inside of Satan's cosmic system. We're going to be living in carnality, which means living in sin. And we're not going to be executing the spiritual life that God has for us and is designed for us because we don't know how to live that life because we don't know the Word of God. And that's what we're seeing in these women and the disciples and really uh, all that they were doing leading up to the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and ultimately, kind of as I said on Tuesday night, wasting their time, especially the day before when they were preparing the spices and herbs to anoint the body. They should have been realizing his, the teachings of Jesus Christ, where he said, I will rise on the third day, as he told them and taught them many, many times about going to Jerusalem, being crucified, and then dying, and then on the third day, he would rise again. They should have been camped out, waiting for the resurrection of Jesus Christ on the third day, but they did not. And ultimately, uh, they got involved in Operation Human Good Works and preparing the spices to embalm his body, thinking he was going to be there forevermore, and forgetting the fact that he was God incarnate, and that he was the Savior and the Messiah, and that he would rise on the third day. Why? Because for whatever reason, they weren't recalling the doctrine that they were taught that should have been resonant within their soul. And in fact, now they're taking wrong actions and doing the wrong things, as we saw the disciples do many, many times. 
ultimately not living uh, the spiritual life that God had designed for them. But again, in the grace of God, he gives forgiveness even for that when people finally wake up to the fact of the wrong decisions and the lack of application of Bible doctrine that they have within their life. And the very last point that I wanted to share, and again, I'm sharing with you now, is that when we forget God's word, what does it do? It takes us to the tomb. And these ladies were brought to the tomb, not in a good way, to wait for the resurrection of our Lord. And in fact, just think about the disciples. They weren't even near the tomb on this third day. They were way back in their houses, let's say in Jerusalem or wherever they were staying at this point in time. Again, they were not living the spiritual life. They were cowering inside their homes, fearful for their lives because of what they saw Jesus Christ go through, rather than recognizing this isn't the plan that God has for them. God's got a greater plan for them. Jesus Christ already told them that they would be the witnesses to the world and would go out and evangelize and preach and teach the kingdom of God. Why would they be thinking now that they were about to be killed and their lives would end? Again, they weren't retaining and recalling and then applying the word of God. And so again, when we do not apply the word of God, as these ladies now were not applying the word of God, it took them to the tomb, but in a wrong way, rather than in a right way of waiting for the resurrection of our Lord. And actually in the notes that I gave you on uh, Tuesday night, and I don't know if I put them in tonight's notes, I might have put in tonight's notes as well. But again, uh, a commentary by the Christ-centered uh, exposition, it says nothing could be more important in Christian life than remembering the gospel, which means God's word. One of our great challenges as Christians is keeping the truth of our Lord uppermost in our minds. We leak, we forget, we wander and stray. But if we keep our feet in the path of his teaching, then we'll never be overcome in times of trouble and sorrow. We will be the only people rejoicing even in the face of death if we keep our minds fixed on the gospel. Again, fixing our eyes on our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So again, that's the little lesson and principle that we find at the end here. And now that the women have realized that uh, all the messages that Jesus Christ had taught had come to fruition, as they were reminded by these angels, as we see in Luke, Luke's account, and then as we're going to see in the Gospels of Matthew, and then uh, uh, we, uh, in Matthew, we'll see Jesus Christ also taught them the same thing and reminded them of the previous doctrine that he taught them. Mark also will reiterate what the angels had told to them. So in Matthew and Mark, what we see in those two Gospels is there's only one angel in view in the narrative, but as Luke tells us, there were two, and John also corroborates what Luke wrote about. Remember, they wrote later, so we see added detail to their Gospel accounts. It was missing in the others, but ultimately in Matthew and Mark, they're mentioning one angel, but uh, Luke and John speak about the two angelic creatures that were present, and all of the Gospels talk about their great apparel which defines them as angelic creatures so to begin let's turn to uh, Matthew uh, in his gospel let's go to Matthew chapter 28 and we'll look at verses 2 through 7a and there are several uh, points and principles that I want to uh, uh, bring out here that are addition to what uh, we've already noted in Luke and give us a little bit more emphasis so in Matthew chapter 28, let me get there myself. I've got the new Bible here, and the pages are not yet used to being flipped and turned. All right, so here we go. So in the Gospel of Matthew chapter uh, 28, verses 2 through 7, I'll start with verse 1. It says, Now after the Sabbath, as it began to dawn towards the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to look at the tomb. And behold, a severe earthquake had occurred, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled away the stone and sat upon 
hit. And that's kind of interesting how he's sitting upon that stone that he rolled away. Again, just relaxing, just hanging out, saying, you know, hey, no big deal here. And, you know, I can just roll the stone away. I can roll it back if I want. I can have it, you know, crushed if I want. No big deal. I've got the power of God in me. So, again, he's got a relaxed mental attitude in view there as he's sitting upon the stone. And then in verse 3, it says, And his appearance was like lightning, and his clothing as white as snow. The guard shook from fear of him, and became like dead men. And the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus, who has been crucified. He is not here, for he has risen. Just as he said. Again, just as he said, the poignant message. Just as he told you previously. And then what do they say? Come see the place where he was lying and go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. And then in verse 8 it says, And they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy and ran and reported to his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, Rejoice. And they came up and took hold of his feet, and worshipped him. And then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go, bring word to my brothers to leave for Galilee, and there they will see me. And then uh, from there, uh, we'll uh, 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 stop, because now it gets into the report of the guards, which we're going to note uh, later on. But uh, again, in Matthew's Gospel, we see his account as defined and giving us a little bit more information, helping us understand about the severe earthquake. Again, we see the appearance of the angels. We see the angels sitting up on the uh, rock that he rolled away, having relaxed mental attitude in regard to the doctrine being fulfilled. Again, God's plan and will being fulfilled in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We see the angel exuding that peace and calm within his soul as everybody else is fear and trembling as they're going about this situation now when we look at verse 4 once again look at that it says the guard shook for fear of him and became like dead men Matthew gives us this account of the guards and uh, ultimately telling us that what they saw so freaked them out that they basically just fainted away Okay, they did not die. It says like dead men, but they totally passed out from fear. That's how uh, 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 awesome the appearance of the angel coming down from heaven, creating that large earthquake, and then rolling the stone away had a grip on their soul. Again, it shook them to their core, so much so, all of them, and let's say there were at least four guards there, and maybe a centurion, a, a leader as well, so maybe five altogether, they all just fainted away. And again, imagine what that was like. And as they witnessed that bolt of lightning coming down, the angel appearing, the sound, breaking the sound barrier, let's say, as he was coming down and having that earthquake that sh was shaking the ground, out. These soldiers witnessed that event. We're not quite sure if the women witnessed that event of the descending of these angels and the opening of the tomb. What we know about the women is they then uh, saw the angel after the tomb was opened. So how much of this did they experience? We don't quite know. But these soldiers, they absolutely experienced it. And it was so awe striking that ultimately it led them to to totally just pass out right then and there. And it seems like they must have been out for some time, okay? Because a lot of things go on, again, with the women having conversations with the angels, the women then having conversations with Jesus Christ. Ultimately, a lot of time went by uh, before everybody probably vacated the situation, and maybe at that point uh, these individuals uh, woke up from their, uh, their fainting spell that they had. Again, they literally passed out at the sight of what they saw. And remember, these are hardened Roman soldiers. Just think about that. Hardened Roman soldiers. You know, you know, we don't know the detail about these individuals. Were they new recruits and just, you know, uh, all of a sudden assigned to this territory and ultimately to this uh, uh, guardship of the tomb? We just don't know. 
But typically the Roman soldier is a hardened soldier who has been through much training and then also much warfare as well. Because again, the kingdom was always being, uh, you know, encroached upon and they always had to defend their kingdom and also go out and develop new territory. So again, these were hardened Roman soldiers who saw much within their lives. And at the sight of this angel, it caused them to completely pass out and faint away. Again, imagine that. Imagine that, what this was like uh, to them, especially as being unbelievers and not recognizing anything about God and the angelic race. Again, it caused them to completely pass out. Then when we look at verse 6, what does it say? It says, the angels now interacting with the women. He is not here, for he has risen, just as he said. And then he says, come see the place where he was lying. So, in Luke's gospel and uh, the other gospels, it makes it seem like the women saw the open tomb and then peered in, and then they saw the angels. Well, here, Matthew gives the account where they, uh, uh, they find the angels outside the tomb, and then the angels invite them in to look at the tomb. So, ultimately, they could see that the body of Jesus Christ was not there, and that he had literally resurrected. He rose from the dead. And then, as I said, we're also going to study uh, uh, John's account and uh, see the added detail that he brings into this. But one of the things that John talks about is the linen clothing of Jesus that he was wrapped in, and then the face cloth that was on top of his face covering that, and how they were in order, in an orderly fashion inside the tomb. It wasn't just a, you know, a hurried mess where, you know, uh, grave robbers came in and then tore off all the linens and just threw it aside. No, everything was in its order. And even the face napkin, as they call it, was rolled up and tucked into its own place on the side. So very interesting how everything was in its own order as Jesus Christ in his resurrection basically just came through those linen clothing and leaving it where it was rather than a hurried unwrapping of this cloth and clothing and then, you know, strewing it all over the tomb. No, it was in orderly fashion. These women came in and were invited to come in by the angels and this is what they witnessed. Then in verse 7, go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. So again, we recognize that the angels are uh, telling them about, first and foremost, Jesus is risen, now giving them instructions to go tell the other disciples that Jesus Christ is written, uh, risen, and then also the other instruction about he's going to meet you in Galilee. So all of you should prepare to go back to your hometown, because remember, all of these uh, uh, apostles and uh, the disciples, the 11 that were left over, remember only Judas Iscariot was from the south region. The rest of them were from the Galilee region. Jesus basically saying, go back to your hometowns and I'll meet you back there. So that was the instruction that they received, and they received it by this angel. And again, a command by this angel to go back and see the risen Lord in that place. Mark also tells us that the angel gave this command, all right, to go back and meet the risen Jesus in Galilee. We're going to see that in just a minute. But we're also going to see an interesting twist as well. Now, let's turn in our Gospels. Let's go to the Gospel of Mark. Let's go to Mark 16. And in Mark chapter 16, in verses 5 through 8, we see the account of what's being paralleled now with the women meeting uh, the angel at the tomb, or uh, again in their gospel, the one angel, but as we know there were two. But in Mark chapter 16, I'll go back to verse 1 to give us the whole context. It says, when the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome, so naming of three women, as Luke is going to name three women for us, but changing out Salome for Joanna, bought spices so that they might come and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen. 
they were saying to one another, Who will roll away the stone from the entrance of the tomb for us? And looking up, they noticed that the stone had been rolled away, for it was extremely large. So again, something they couldn't have done, but somebody else had done it. And we know the angel is the one that did it. Now it says they saw a young man sitting at the right, wearing a white robe, and they were amazed. But he said to them, do not be amazed. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene who has been crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See, here is the place where they laid him. So again, this standing at the right might have been where the, the stone was rolled away. As Matthew says, he was sitting upon the stone. So again, they rolled it from left to right. Uh, he's there outside the tomb, and then ultimately uh, having the women come in and look at the tomb and see that the body of Jesus was not there. So again, uh, do not be amazed. You are looking for Jesus who has been crucified. He is risen. He is not here. Here is the place where they laid him. Now we see the instruction in verse 7. Go tell the disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you to Galilee, there you will see him. And then it goes on to say, just as he told you. I'm going to come back to that in just a minute. And they went out and fled from the tomb for trembling and astonishment had gripped them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Now, if I haven't told you this before, I'm going to give it to you now. And even if I did tell you before, just to remind you now, the rest of the Gospel of Matthew is probably not in the original document that, excuse me, in the rest of the Gospel of Mark, is probably not, and I'd say is not, in the original writing that Mark had penned, okay? The earliest manuscripts that we have of Mark's Gospel do not include everything from verse 9 all the way to the end, which again is verse 20 as we see it. That's why you should have brackets around, starting at verse 9, going all the way down to uh, verse 20. And in fact, after what you would think is verse 20, there's one more little paragraph, okay? And that, too, is an addition to Mark's gospel, all right? So even though when we read these things, we see some of it being paralleled in the other gospel accounts, so we can take it as truth, there are other things in here that we just seem more fanciful, and ultimately uh, uh, probably should not be here at all. So in any case, what we recognize is that Mark's gospel stops at verse 8. So the last thing that Mark gives to us in his gospel is the trembling and fear of these women. But prior to that, the announcement from the angels, go back to Galilee and you will meet Jesus Christ there. All right. So that ultimately is where Mark ends his gospel. So what we see here in this account in Mark is that he talks about the women entering the tomb on their own and then meet with the angels or one of the angels, as it were. As we look at verse 6, it says, But he said to them, Do not be amazed. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene, who has been crucified. He has risen. He is not here. Here is the place where they laid him. So as they now appearing into the tomb, again, the angel is in there with them at this point in time and saying, Here's the place where they laid him. Go look for yourselves and see ultimately the slab on which they laid him inside the tomb and you will not find his body. And then again, as we noted, John gives us more detail about the clothing that remained there that the women then saw. Matthew and Mark don't tell us about that and the wrappings of Jesus at this point in time. So ultimately they show the resurrection of or of Jesus Christ. Now, as we see in verse 7, but go tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. And uh, again, we see the angel instructing the women to go back to the disciples, tell them that 
uh, Jesus will meet them up in Galilee to prepare themselves and all uh, head up that way. Ultimately, the resurrected Jesus would meet them in that place. It's kind of interesting that we have that in the Gospels, okay? Because it seems from reading it this way that the first time Jesus Christ is going to introduce himself in resurrection form to the disciples is up in Galilee, doesn't it? Okay? He meets the, you know, the angel meets the women, okay? And then ultimately we see uh, 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 them giving instructions to the disciples, hey, get up to Galilee, that's where Jesus is going to meet up with you, okay? Just as he told you. And again, uh, I, I stated incorrectly on Tuesday night that there is no uh, definition in regard to Jesus saying this, but there actually is, okay? There's a brief little saying, I'm going give, to give you that to you in a few minutes, during the Passover celebration where Jesus gave them this instruction. But again, very brief and very quick. You could easily, as I did, you know, forget all about it. But in any case, Jesus Christ did give them that instruction ahead of time, and I'll give you that in just a minute. But in any case, uh, the instruction is there. It seems like that's where the resurrection Jesus is going to meet them, but we know later on in the day Jesus does appear to them in that upper room, as it were. Again, we could assume where they celebrated the Passover supper. He met them in that place and ultimately uh, interacted with them on that very day. But then when we see the gospel accounts and into the gospel and, and uh, a little bit in the book of Acts, then we see them all up in Galilee and ultimately interacting with in that region and we don't have a lot of detail of that uh, but we are going to see some as we get there in the gospels that do have those accounts so very interesting that mark's gospel ends with that it seems like jesus's first interaction with the disciples post-resurrection will be there up in galilee rather than here down in jerusalem but we see something different in the gospel accounts that he did meet them on that day in jerusalem as it says in verse 8, And they went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had gripped them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Now, when we have this phrase, they said nothing to anyone, what we assume there is from the tomb until they got, say, back into Jerusalem or wherever else the disciples were staying, okay, probably in Jerusalem, as we've noted. But ultimately, in their walk back to Jerusalem, as they were passing people, they weren't going all the way rejoicing and telling everybody in earshot, Jesus is risen, Jesus is risen, Jesus is risen, okay? They didn't say a word to anybody until they got to the disciples first and foremost. Kind of interesting how they would do that, all right? Maybe they were being ultra uh, obedient, where the angel, and then we see Jesus also giving the instruction to go back to the disciples and tell them that I have risen and I'm going to meet them in Galilee. Maybe they wanted to wait to tell the disciples first and heed the order of Jesus, okay? But Jesus didn't tell them, don't say anything to anybody else, but yet they chose not to, according to Mark's gospel. So along the road back to, into Jerusalem, they didn't say a word to anyone else until they got to the disciples, and then they spilled it all, again, gave all the information to the disciples. So they kept the news to themselves until they reached the disciples, and then ultimately gave them the firsthand account of the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. And again, we also uh, see that as stated in Matthew chapter 28 in verse 8 as well. And again, in verse 8, it says, Then they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy and ran to report it to the disciples. All right, so that's what Matthew says, and that's what they did, and they didn't say a word to anybody until they got to the disciples. So again, keeping it within close quarters, let's say, you know, who knows why they kept it to themselves, but uh, for many, many reasons they did. But ultimately, uh, this is what we recognize. They were told first, then the disciples were given the next account, and then we're going to see how the disciples don't believe their account and had to prove it for themselves. 
But before we get there, I wanted to emphasize the women's reaction to everything that is going on here. Because both Matthew and Mark utilize great adjectives in regard to the reaction that these women had, and then as we've already noted, that the guards had as well. And so when we look at these things, ultimately, the first word that we uh, take away from this in the Gospel of Matthew is that they had fear. And you should know the Greek word for fear is that Greek, uh, Greek word phobos, to where we get our word phobia from, okay? And again, a fear of thump something or fear of anything. But as we recognize in the application in the Greek language, it would mean terror or being frightened, but it also meant respect and reverence, okay? So uh, that word is used in a duality throughout Scripture, and especially in regard to our relationship with God, that there should be fear, again, literal fear of the awe and might and power of God, that is coupled then with awe, reverence, and respect. And so when we see the women's reaction here to the angelic creatures and the announcement that was given, and now they're leaving, all of this is going on in their soul. So just think how excited they were and how fearful they were in regard to the awesome sight of the angelic creature. And then as we know, they also met the Lord Jesus Christ during this event as well. But then also having the news of the resurrection and the information that they are now to share back with the apostles. So we see the combination of the terror, the fear in the awesomeness of who God is, but with reverence and respect in, in regard to God, the angels, and everything that's going on. And that's kind of how we should be functioning and operating in our spiritual life as well. Sometimes we forget about God and the power of God and the righteousness and justice of God within our lives. And we forget that little bit of fear that we should be having of the all-powerful, almighty God that is our creator. Because sometimes we get a little too big for our britches and we think, oh, it's just us. And it's just me. And it's just humanity. Because we don't see God all the time. And we don't see the power of God all the time. And we don't see the judgment of God coming into our lives all the time. And we can get a little slack and a little bit lazy. And we start to think in humanistic terms. And we forget about the awesomeness that is God. And again, even in our you know, society today, you know, when evangelists are out there, you know, we're in the, you know, the, the, the kid glove, the mamby-pamby type of Christianity today where we just want to be soft and fuzzy and warm and cuddly and speak about the love of God, the love of Jesus. Love, 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 okay? But love from a soft, vanilla, and, uh, you know, in, uh, not intrusive type of God. And our evangelism has now stopped preaching the truth of the judgment of God upon the soul of the unbeliever. And that there is an eternal lake of fire that the unbeliever will reside in for all of eternity. We've forgotten the fire and the brimstone. And why is that? Well, the fire and brimstone got attacked. That type of Christianity got attacked, got attacked, and has been being attacked. And it's harsh, and it's mean, and it's wicked, and it's evil, and it's not nice. And so nobody wants to talk about that anymore. And what has that done? It's taken the fear of God and the judgment of God out of our society. And now our society thinks anything goes. And we can do anything. We can be anything we want. And especially when we're talking about the whole, you know, the gay and lesbian and transgender and all that stuff that we see all over the place, more and more and more. And why is that prevalent? Because people have forgotten of the judgment of God in our lives. And the judgment of God, that is what? Loving, okay? That is loving. And God's judgment comes to do what? protect the innocent and the righteous, to bring about justice. And again, if you're in a society like our society is becoming more and more each and every day, if you are a society without judgment and justice for crimes being committed, 
what are you going to have? You're going to have anarchy. And now the criminal will be empowered and the victims will be suffering more and more and more. But God knows. And again, go back to the book of Genesis and Exodus. Go back to the law and how God had Israel treat the criminals or the sinners, the ones that broke the law back in that day. What was God doing? He was getting rid of them from society. Why? Because, you know, when, there's no rehabilitation in these people, okay? And again, our prisons aren't filled with people that are going to be rehabilitated, okay? But yet we let them out every day. What do they do? They come back and commit more crimes, and they commit more crimes, and more crimes, and more terror, and more fear. I mean, just think about, you know, a, a five-foot, six-inch man in Pennsylvania had the whole eastern part of Pennsylvania locked down and frightened of fear for the last two weeks because he escaped from prison. And the whole society had fear, but not the right kind of fear. So again, when we don't remove those type of people from our society, they just come back, more crime, more crime, more crime. God had them get out, done away with. And in the eternal state, it's the same thing. For those who don't want righteousness and justice and don't want to live according to the will and plan of God and the love of God that is working in their lives, God's just going to say, you're removed, you're dismissed. And you're going to be locked away so that you can't affect these people over here who have received my righteousness, my justice, and my love. And that group's going to go off into eternity in the preciousness of God. So again, that is missing in our society today. And the more you know, we write our laws, the more we operate as a society to accept, 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 and social justice and equity and all this other garbage that's out there, again, what is it doing? It's just bringing more evil upon more evil upon more evil, and it's having more of a negative, negative, and negative effect. Onto who? The victims and the ones who don't want this and the ones who are righteous in their function and in their operations. So again, a little bit of fear goes a long way, especially in a society and certainly in our Christian way of life. Now when we talk about believers, again, we need it too. Because again, as we start to forget about the power of God and the justice and righteousness of God and the mandates and commandments that we see in the Word of God for the church age believer, we start to forget about these things. We forget about the divine discipline of God within our lives. What do we do? We drift and we start to dabble back into sin and to unholiness and unrighteousness. And we get ourselves in trouble. And ultimately, because we're not fearing God as we should. And when we fear God, we have respect for God. And we have reverence and awe as we should. Now, the other thing that these ladies also had was great joy. So again, how the two work hand in hand. You see, when you have fear and reverence together, and you function and operate with that, guess what? You also have a joy in your soul, a joy of the freedom and joy of the righteousness and joy of the miraculous as well. And it's interesting that, you know, chara is the Greek word for joy. They didn't just have joy, but they had mega, megas in the Greek word, mega as we would say. They had very much joy within their life. In other words, they were very very happy at the same time that they had fear and trembling and astonishment. I'm going to show you those words too. So in Matthew, we see fear and great joy going hand in hand and how you can have those two things working in your soul at the same time. And that's how we should function and operate as well. As we understand and know our God, and then we understand the love of God, the righteousness of God, the justice of God, the freedom of God, the grace of God. Again, now we can have that joy of God because our soul is freed up. 
and we're not fearful of sin and wickedness and evil that could overcome and penetrate our lives. Instead, we are looking forward to the resurrection and the eternal state. Now, when we look at Mark's gospel, what are the reactions that Mark talks about? Well, they had trembling. Traumas is the Greek word. It means quaking, quivering, trembling. And remember, we saw the great earthquake, the CEO, okay, S-E-I-O. We talked about that, the word for earthquake. This is, could be a synonymous earth, uh, 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 to that type of word for quaking. But this one's a little different. You see, traumas here is not the earthquake uh, shaking everything, but it's the trembling on the inside, okay? And we see this word being used in 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Ephesians, and Philippians. And we see this as a description for that fear and trembling that people can have when they are just overwhelmed with what's happening. And in this case, in a good way. And so this word for trembling, a trauma, is the physical result of having that fear and that overwhelming sense of awe based on seeing the angel, interaction with the angel, and then now knowing that Jesus Christ is raised from the dead. And it's actually uh, interesting that, uh, uh, you know, we have this word and uh, recognizing how it's uh, also applied throughout the scriptures. And as I have on, on the next slide, you know, this is, it's kind of interesting how uh, Matthew talks about the mental attitude that these women had, fear and great joy. Now we see Mark's gospel, and what is he doing? He's talking about the physiological effects of that fear and great joy. And the physiological effect of having that fear is that they began to tremble. There was some shaking and quaking, okay? And now you have probably experienced this in your own life in both situations. Sometimes you're just overwhelmed with joy. You kind of get a little jittery, okay? You get so much happiness going on. You're just overwhelmed by the situation. And then other times, if you're scared to death, you have that shaking and quivering. I remember uh, uh, you know, I had a friend uh, as a say, teenager, uh, early teenager, and uh, one time uh, I was hiding behind the door, okay, and he came around the corner, and I ran out and jumped at him, and I went, rah, you know, just, to, I meant to scare him, okay, well, I got him good, and he was so scared from me jumping out, and so startled, he basically shook and quivered, and he did fall to the ground, he fell right to the ground, kind of felt bad for him, okay, he didn't pass out like the soldiers did, but we can see why the soldiers would pass out, okay, these women had that type of fear and trembling going on in their soul, but I would also say they probably had a really good adrenaline rush going on in their body because there's a lot happening right now. There's a lot of information, a lot of news. They're seeing things. They're hearing things. They're all excited. The one that they thought was dead eternally because they came to anoint the body is now alive eternally and is presenting himself right before them. And so after having all this going on uh, within their lives, now they're going to walk back and tell the disciples. You can almost see them kind of shaking and trembling as they're going back. So again, the adrenaline rush of everything that's going on and the news that they had received. And then we see in Mark also the astonishment, which is ecstasis, where we get our word ecstasy from. But again, being amazed, astonished. And then it also can be uh, translated as displacement of mind, okay? Well, what does that remind us of? Well, our slang or idiom that we could say is that you blew my mind, okay? Or their mind was blown. They were blown away, absolutely blown away, as we would say in our society today. In other words, they just, like, I know this is happening. I know this is all going on. I understand the information, but I just can't believe it, as they say. I just can't believe it, even though they did believe, okay? But we have that mental attitude, like, I can't believe this is really happening, you know? Is, is, is all this really going on? Amazement, astonishment. Again, their minds were blown. 
And so that's what we see in regard uh, uh, to the women in Matthew and Mark's account. And we see the duality of emotions at this event. We see the fear and the, the scared, the frightness, okay, of the awesome events. But then we have the joy and the understanding of the resurrection of the Lord and the excitement that they had in the mentality of their soul. And we see it from the mental attitude thought and also the physiological reactions that their bodies were experiencing at that time. And this reminds us of the birth announcement back in Luke chapter 2, verse 9, when the angel announced the birth of the Lord. And the astonishment that the shepherds had when they heard this news, and then they went to see the baby, and then on their way home. Again, they too experienced this duality of emotion and physiological effect of the fear and awe and wonder and respect of who and God, uh, what God is, but at the same time, the joy and the great happiness within their soul. And then, as we also noted already, again, uh, Matthew talked about the guards shaken with fear, shaken with fear. And again, as I just told you about my uh, young friend who I almost scared to death, okay? Because that's another way we could say it. They were scared to death, okay? That's what these soldiers experienced. They were scared to death. They literally didn't die, okay? But they did pass out and fainted due to the fear. And again, this is a frightening fear. This isn't the reverence, awe, and respect type of fear, okay? Because if it was that, they would have been bowing their knees to these angelic creatures. No, this was frightened to death, as we would say. And again, give you another little uh, side note story uh, uh, when I used to be in the business world, uh, my boss and I had to go to San Francisco uh, for a business meeting one time. And uh, we were, uh, after you know business, we were going out to dinner. We were down to Fisherman's Wharf down there, and there's all kinds of sideshows going on there, people playing drums and buckets and music and all other kind of stuff. And we're just nonchalantly walking down the street. We're walking, 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 and there was a guy that we didn't know standing behind these two big palm branches, okay, standing there still. And when we got up to him, he basically split it apart, came out, and said, blah, blah, blah. Okay? I took about a step back. My boss was like six feet behind me, okay? <laughs> he went way back, okay? He went way back. But we both were startled completely by the shock and awe of that event. Fortunately, neither one of us passed out, okay? But in this event, these soldiers passed out. Seeing the descending of these angels, the bright light that came down, the earthquake that shook based on them probably landing on the ground, and then did they see the stone roll away? Again, were they already out by this point? Probably, okay, because <laughs> the angel arrived first, and then he rolled the stone away, all right? So they probably already passed out by the time the stone got rolled away. But just a great event. And the shock and awe of the fright and fearfulness that they had shook them to their core, ultimately scared them to death, as we would say, where they completely passed out. Now, what we also see, let's go back to the Gospel of Matthew. Let's go back to Matthew, okay? Chapter 28, verses 9 and 10. Because as we've noted, the women after engaging with the angelic creatures, okay, and again, in Matthew and Mark, they only mention one creature, but we know from Luke and uh, 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 John, there were two. But Matthew also tells us in verses 9 and 10 that Jesus appeared to the women. And he too told, the uh, told them to tell the disciples, meet me up in Galilee. So as it says in verse 8, it says, and they left the tomb quickly, with fear and great joy, and ran and reported to his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, Rejoice! And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Now, I just want to have you pause there, because when we go into the Gospel of John, which we're not going to do tonight, okay, when we go there, John only gives Mary Magdalene the credit here. It only speaks about her meeting Jesus and her clinging to Jesus, okay? Here we see all the women, okay? 
and they all took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go, bring word to my brothers to leave for Galilee, and there they will see me. So Matthew gives us this account as well. So as they interact with the angels, now they're leaving the tomb scene, and somewhere you know, along the way, before they get to the disciples, again, probably in the garden area of the tomb, they met Jesus Christ. And again, they worshipped him and clung to him and, you know, were very uh, a joy to see him. And as we also noted in regard is what Jesus said in regard to what the angels said in Mark chapter 16, verse 7. It states that the uh, angel instructed the women, where in Matthew we see both the angel and Jesus instructing the women. But Matthew added that extra phrase, just as he told you. So when the angels were instructing the women, he said, just as he told you. And unfortunately, again on Tuesday, uh, if you were able to see it, maybe it was a good thing that the video was cut out for that part, okay? I didn't think that there was any instruction that Jesus had given. But then in further investigation, again, the Holy Spirit said, hey, you got to look into that a little bit more. So I did a little more research on this, and I found it, okay? Many of you might have noted. But Matthew and Mark previously recorded Jesus telling the disciples during the Passover celebration. Again, this isn't recorded in Luke, which we studied in detail. All right. So in Matthew and Mark, it is recorded. <clears throat> and during the Passover celebration, Jesus said that after he raised, is raised from the dead, he would go ahead of them to Galilee. And so during the Passover celebration, Jesus gave them that information in Matthew 26, 32, and then in Mark chapter 14, verse 28. And both verses are identical in the English, okay? So both verses are identical. Let me give you those verses now. Again, I'll show you Matthew, but Mark is absolutely identical in uh, Matthew 26, 32. It says, but after I have been raised, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. So apparently, this one little phrase was the big instruction that Jesus gave them to go meet me up in Galilee after I've been raised, okay? But here, it's basically a promise, and maybe we assume there was a little bit more communication here, and it was also an invitation and command for them to go to Galilee to meet him there. But ultimately, Jesus said, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. So Jesus Christ was resurrected. He spent that day, as we know, in Jerusalem, and we're going to see the rest of the discussion of that in the upcoming uh, uh, messages about the two men on the road to e uh, Emu, uh, Emus, and then also meeting the disciples in the upper room that night, okay? But then after that, we don't have anything in detail of a day-by-day -day account of Jesus' uh, whereabouts and his doings. But we do have some information, a little bit, about interactions with the disciples up in Galilee. And so we'll study that. We'll note that. Not in Luke. I don't believe it's in Luke, but in the other Gospels, uh, in the Gospel of uh, Matthew and John, we'll see a little bit more of the detail. Okay? But we do know that Jesus Christ uh, did give that instruction. The angelic creatures gave that instruction to the women to give to the disciples and Jesus himself gave that instruction to the women to give to the disciples. I will go ahead of you to Galilee. And it seems like Jesus Christ went up there before they got there because he could just poof and be there, you know, the day after his resurrection where the disciples it would take them several days to get back to Galilee. So again, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. So as we uh, wrap it up for tonight, you know, this must have been what Jesus and the angels were referring to. And it was Jesus' instructions to them, as we understand, about meeting them after his resurrection, where Luke and Mark do not mention Jesus meeting the disciples uh, in Galilee after his resurrection, but Matthew and John do. Okay, so as we've already noted, Mark's gospel ends here in verse 8, 
Luke does not speak about this interaction in Galilee, but Matthew and John do give us information, as we will note towards the end of our discussion of the resurrection and then the ascension of Jesus in Matthew 28, 16 to 20, and then in John 21, verses 1 through 23. So, with that, we have now concluded the interaction of the women with the angelic creatures, and now Jesus at the tomb. Now they've gone back and reported it to the disciples. And when we come back on Sunday, we're going to see the disciples' reaction, both mentally and physically, to the news that they have received. And like we've already noted, again, they, the disciples still weren't applying their doctrine. They weren't recalling and because they hadn't retained the word that Jesus had given them. And with that, they too were in doubt, and they too were led to the tomb, but in a wrong way. They were led to the tomb to prove what was going on, not to say, oh, I believe it, and I'm going to go worship him there. Okay? They went to prove to themselves from a physical, humanistic way. i got to see it with my own eyes. Again, as Jesus Christ said many times, the Jews look for signs, and that's ultimately what they were doing. What's the sign? Where is it? And, then, and you know the rest of the story with Doubting Thomas, even when they, all the other disciples said, this happened. Thomas said, until I put my finger into his hands and into his feet and into his side, I will not believe. And then Jesus gives him the dressing down, seeing you have believed, blessed are those who have believed and yet not seen. And so that will be coming up in the narratives in the future. But now we see the great uh, astonishment and the uh, great women that were at the tomb of Jesus Christ. And ultimately, as I didn't say, but I'll uh, start on Sunday with this, the great blessing it was for them to see Jesus Christ in resurrection form before anybody else. So again, that was a great blessing to them, as we know. All right, so we'll leave it off there this evening, and we'll uh, pick it up on Sunday. So let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, and uh, for the blessings that you have provided for us each and every day. And Father, we just ask that knowing more and more about your son, Jesus Christ, and certainly his resurrection as we're currently studying, that that gives us a greater awe and respect for you and for him and for the great salvation that you have provided for each and every one of us. So, Father, we ask for our, our travel blessings on the way home this evening. In Christ's precious name, amen. All right, thank you very much. If you have any questions, let me know.